This picture on the screen that uh, hopefully you can see better now that we have new projectors was first, uh, I first came across it when I moved into my office at the St. Paul United Methodist Church in, in Little Rock. St. Paul was the first church that I served that when I arrived had furniture in it besides a desk. It had chairs and it had a table and it had, it had extra bookcases and it had a door that you could go out into a courtyard. It was, it was very nice. And it had two pieces of artwork. One was this picture. It was over a bookcase. And so as I was moving in and unpacking, I moved it from over the bookcase to over my desk so that when I wrote sermons, this is what I looked at most of the time. Seven years later... When it was time for me to, to leave St. Paul and to be the next pastor at First United Methodist Church in Sheridan, Arkansas, as I was packing up my books and getting my belongings and all those things that you tend to gather over time, over seven years of ministry in one place, I sat at my, in my chair and I looked up at that painting and I thought, I wonder if they noticed if I took it. I mean, I had given them seven years of my life, seven long years. We had been through a lot of storms at St. Paul together, me and this portrait, this picture, this painting. I left it, though, because it was the right thing to do. I left it. And I moved to Sheridan without it. I think I was somewhere, oh, by the way, in Sheridan I had a desk, that was it. I learned that when I renovate offices, the bishop calls me the next spring and I move. So no renovation of offices ever again. <laughs> but I moved in and the copying machine actually was in my office too. We had to get that out of there. But I kind of made it my own. And somewhere in uh, probably my second year of ministry there, maybe, maybe earlier than that, maybe a little later than that, I preached on this painting. And I want to I wanna share a little bit of the details of it. If you can see it, it's, it's, you can see that um, in the far background, there are lightning bolts that are still as a part of the storm on the shore. There's another boat, as, as Mark tells us, other boats were with him. Look at the disciples. One is holding up the sail. They all look tired. One, look at me, church. One is down like this. He's worn out. And there's Jesus with his arms outstretched, speaking to the storm. And under, under the painting that was in my office for those seven years are these words. And he arose and rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. On my last Sunday in Sheridan, my good friend J.N. and Peggy Ski came to see me on Sunday morning with a present. Wrapped in a bow was the painting. <laughs> They'd found it somewhere, and they gave it to me. To me! So I... I took it to Paragold, and it hung on my walls for six years in Paragold, and I took it to Batesville because it was mine, and it hung on my walls as I was a district superintendent, and guess where it is right now? A few hundred feet back here on one of the walls in my office behind the couch where I see it every day. I love this painting because I love this passage of Scripture. Let's look a little closer at it today. One of the things that I hope that you know is that we're in the midst of a sermon series that we're, we're looking at questions that Jesus asked. It's based on a, a book by Magri de Vega that I've been reading. We ask Jesus a lot of questions, and in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus turns back often and asks his followers questions too. Sometimes disciples Sometimes folks in the crowd, and he asks them questions. You had homework to do. Did you do it? Last week, the question was, who is Jesus to you? 
Jesus phrased it this way, who do you say that I am? And I asked you to spend a little time with that question. I hope that you did. If you didn't, it's not too late. You can still ask that question, who do you say that I am? The second question I want to ask today, and I'm going to ask the question, and then I want to unpack this scripture lesson for us. Jesus turns to the disciples and he asks them, after he calms the sea, why are you afraid? That's the question. Why are you afraid? Mark's version of the story, actually Matthew tells it twice and Luke tells it once. They all tell it, three of the four gospel writers. Jesus suggests that at the end of a long day of teaching and healing and feeding, they get into a boat. He says, let's go across to the other side. Now, the other side is the other side of the Sea of Galilee. I've not been to the Sea of Galilee. Many of you have been to the Sea of Galilee. Its shortest distance from one shore to the other would have taken two hours to complete by boat. Its farthest shore, kind of diagonal, from one shore to the other would have taken five hours to cross. So you know the disciples are in the boat at least a couple of hours, maybe five. And at its deepest level, the Sea of Galilee is 150 feet deep. And as the storms on it, well, they, they were common. They would come over the ridges, over the mountains, and before you knew it, a storm was on top of you. It happened all the time. Imagine being in that boat with Jesus. Can you, choir, can you all do that? Can you imagine being in that boat? You're talking about what you have just seen. You're thinking about what you have just heard, how the lame had, had received uh, the ability to walk, how the blind had been able to see, how those were hungry, had been fed. All these things Jesus was saying. At some point on that trip across the Sea of Galilee, from one side to the other, whether it's two hours or five, a furious squall comes in. That's what Mark calls it, a furious squall. And the winds began to shake, and the clouds began to roar, and the water that was supposed to be in the Sea of Galilee was suddenly in the boat, and the disciples are battling the storm. They are bailing water as quickly as they can. Can you picture that? They are fighting the storm, and the storm is winning. <laughs> the storm is winning. Now, the Bible doesn't say this, but don't you imagine, said, where is Jesus when we need him? Where is Jesus? He was in the boat, back in the stern on the cushion, asleep, in the boat, in the storm. And it's not an accidental nap, not the kind that we sometimes, I sometimes take while I'm watching baseball at night, right? <laughs> or a movie. I mean, he is reclining. He's resting. He's asleep. And one of the disciples goes, and we don't know which one, we don't know if they called out to him. They don't know if he shook him. And they said, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Did anyone hear the word teacher? Did you hear the word teacher? That's who he is. I mean, we're just four chapters into the Gospel of Mark, right? Just four chapters. They don't call him Savior. They don't call him Master. They don't call him Lord. Not yet. He hadn't done much to, to warrant that in their opinion, but he really has. Teacher, do you not care about us the way that you cared about the man who was born lame? Uh, do you not care about us about the, like the way that the woman who, who was restored her sight? Do you not care for us, Lord, that, that you would feed us? Lord, do you not care that we are perishing? I'm going to let that just kind of sit there for a minute. Do you not care? Well, I can imagine Jesus rising. You ever woken up from an unexpected nap and wiping the sleep from his eyes, maybe? And he kind of looks at the storm. Now, I want you to know in Matthew's version of this, he doesn't speak to the storm first. He speaks to the disciples first. But I like Mark better, so we're using Mark. Mark 
has Jesus speak to the storm first. And he says to the storm, peace, be still. And if you saw that picture again of that's in my office, the storm is retreating. Thank you. The storm is retreating. The waters are glassy. And there's calm. And Jesus turns back to the disciples and he asks our question of the day. Why are you, what are you afraid of? I'm going to let that linger. What are you afraid of? He asks the second question too. This is the new John Fleming version. <laughs> he asks this question. Where's your faith? Where's your faith? I did a quick Google search of the things that I thought that we might be afraid of. And so I discovered that these are the top things we're afraid of. On the screen you'll see them. We are afraid of failure. We are afraid of rejection. We are afraid of change. 62% of people are afraid of public speaking. I'm glad I overcame that one. <laughs> we're afraid of not being good enough. We are afraid of the height, of heights. We're afraid of the dark. We're afraid of animals. We're afraid of clowns. I guess Stephen King had something to do with that. I'm not sure. We're afraid that there won't be enough time in the day to do all that we have to do. We're afraid of being lonely. Those are the top ones, right? That's what we're afraid of. But that's not what Jesus asks us. He asks us, why are you afraid? I want to go back to that image of the storm, back to the Sea of Galilee, back to the storms of your life. And I want to say this, storms are not always weather-related, amen? They are not always weather-related. They don't always have to do with the barometric pressure and the wind speeds and that sort of thing. Sometimes they are health-related storms. Sometimes they are pressure-related storms, situations that we go through. I want to say three things quickly about storms that I hope will be helpful for you. First, some storms come quickly. Just like they did on the Sea of Galilee, they come over those ridges of the mountain, and suddenly the storm is there. Have you, have you seen it? I went running yesterday morning, and it was a beautiful day. The sun was shining. When I finished up, I almost got wet again like I did in that video <laughs> today. Storms come quickly. You know that, don't you? Someone says, well, I just saw him yesterday. What do you mean he's gone? What do you mean he died? What did you say, doctor? Storms come quickly. Here's the second thing I want you to see about storms. Storms take over nearly every part of your life. When you're in the middle of a storm, they take over. It's hard to work. It's hard to sleep. It's hard for any kind of relationship that you are in. They won't stand it until the calm waters come again. And here's the third thing. Storms end. Amen? There's no storm that has been brewing for 40 or 50 or 60 years, right? Storms start, they form, and they end. And whatever storm you're in, it's going to end. It's going to be over. And Jesus is going to speak to it. And he's going to say, peace be still. What we forget, what we forget is that Jesus is in the boat with us. He's right there in the stern, probably not sleeping. He's right there with us all the time. Amen? And he's right here with us too. Amen? 
I ran across a saying. I don't know who said it the first time. It's, I didn't say it. It's not original to me. But I found it, and I want to share it with you. It goes like this. We don't need to tell God how big our storms are. We need to tell our storms how big our God is. Peace. Be still. Amen.